Yeah, should I go ahead? All right, uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Barry. Today, we're gonna talk about ranges. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a C++ developer at Jump Trading. Uh, it's a research and technology-driven trading firm. Uh, I've been there for getting close to nine years. It's a, it's a pretty cool place to work. Uh, outside of work, I've been involved in C++ standardization since 2016, 2017. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff that has uh, made it into C++ 20 and C++ 23. Uh, I've been involved with things like deducing this, and if const eval, a bunch of const expert relaxations, uh, and a bunch of ranges work, uh, which, is, which is basically why I'm giving this talk today. Um, outside of that, you can find me kind of all over social media. Um, that's the avatar that I use everywhere. That uh, was my dog, Hannah. Um, I have a blog that I post to occasionally and mostly about optional references. Um, you can find me on Twitter, and I probably answered a bunch of your Stack Overflow questions over the years. Uh, so this, this talk focuses exclusively on one fairly short example. Uh, we're going to start with an input stream. Uh, it's going to have just a bunch of incident, nothing, nothing special about it. I'm going to construct an iStream view over it. Uh, so for those of you unfamiliar, uh, views iStream is a range factory. Uh, it takes a stream and a type, and it gives you a range of elements of that type extracted lazily from that stream. Uh, so if I run this loop, uh, no surprises here. I'm going to print all the numbers 1 through 9, uh, prefix of the loop. Um, this range ends when one of two things happen. Either some extraction fails. So if my stream had a character in it, that's not something you can convert to an int. Uh, or in this case, uh, when the stream just runs out. Uh, but the nice thing about ranges is that ranges compose. Uh, so I can take my iStream view and compose it with take view, uh, which you can write this way with the normal function syntax, or you can write uh, this way using the pipe syntax, which I kind of prefer because you get this nice uh, top to bottom or left to right ordering. Um, and of course, when you do take five, you get one of the all-time great jazz standards. I mean, <laughs> Dave Brubeck's a genius. It's pretty cool to have a piece in five, and the drum solo is, um, sorry, I'm getting off track. Uh, what you get here is, is, of course, like the first five numbers. Um, so take five doesn't have a precondition, doesn't like require that there are five elements in a range. If, if our stream was much shorter, we wouldn't like run off the end, we would just print two. Um, so take five really means take, take out most five elements. Um, so if we go back to our nine, uh, so now let's say we want to do more processing after this, right? We printed our five elements, but we kind of want to keep going. There might be more stuff in the stream that we have to do. Uh, so we try to extract the next element. And so, so what does this print? Uh, so who thinks it prints one? Uh, no takers on one. Who thinks it prints six? Right, so the red might be a kind of a hint, and I guess if it printed six, this wouldn't be a very long or especially interesting talk. Uh, so it actually prints a seven. Um, and so as you might notice from the fact of like, my carefully chosen input, that the seven and the five aren't exactly consecutive elements in the stream. And you might wonder what happened to the six. Uh, and indeed, perhaps a better title for this talk is Take Five, The Search for the Missing Six. Uh, and, and so the goal of this talk is really to answer this question, like what happened to the six? Uh, where did it go? Where did we go wrong? And in order to do that, we have to take a timeout. Um, because if I dive right in and start talking about range adapters, that, that's a little bit too much. So we kind of have to go, go blank slate and go all the way back to the beginning uh, to the C++ iterator model. In that model, if I have a range of two elements, how many iterator positions are there? Three. Right. So I have one for the first element, one for the second element, and one for this past the end null element. Now, there might be an element there. There might not be. It doesn't really matter. Uh, there always needs to be an iterator position to represent that last element. And so, so ranges in C++ in our model are always half open. Um, and this is a really important thing to keep in mind. I'm going to keep coming back to this uh, over the course of the talk. Um, so of course, iterators aren't very useful without algorithms. So we're going to start by talking about algorithms. Take destroy. Uh, this is an algorithm that we had since the beginning. Uh, it just runs through and calls the destructor of every element. Uh, it's not, not particularly complicated. Um, and once upon a time, this was the signature for it. It takes two iterators, returns void. Uh, but then C++20 rolls mm -hmm. along and relaxes this model a little bit. So now we have this concept of iterator sentinel. They don't have to be the same type anymore. Um, and this is a really useful uh, abstraction. Um, but of course, we don't want to return void anymore because uh, we, can, we can do something a little bit better. Um, so if we go back to Stepanov, as, as we always should, um, he, he gives us this, this thing called the law of useful return. Uh, which says that a procedure should return all the potentially useful information it computed. Um, and so in the original case, with our void destroy that took two iterators, there wasn't any additional information, uh, but now there is, right? What is the end iterator? Um, it could be the sentinel, uh, but if the sentinel um, is something that like, we're looking for, uh, that might take work to compute, and that's useful for us to return. Um, so now destroy is going to return that new end iterator that it computed along the way. Like, it has to do this work anyway, so it might as well just give it to us at the end, right? 
Now we have another version of this algorithm called destroy n. Um, and there are a lot of pairs of algorithms like this in the standard library, one that takes iterator sentinel and one that takes iterator count. And so if we try to implement destroy n, like this isn't very hard to do, uh, we can just write our simple for loop that counts up to n, increments first as we go, and destroys every element. Uh, and maybe it's a little cleaner if I make it more obvious that the loop is just counting from 0 to n, um, and the body is destroying the element uh, and incrementing first as we go, and then, and then we return it. Um, so, so this is a correct implementation. It's totally fine. Um, and for destroy and destroy n, it's, you know, we're, we're kind of like repeating the logic of the algorithm, but, but this is basically a for each. It's not a very complicated algorithm. Uh, but in general, it's pretty unsatisfactory to just like duplicate your, your algorithm logic. And you can imagine for the more complicated pairs that have to do a lot more work, um, like the uninitialized move and copy algorithms that have to do cleanup in case of exceptions, it'd be really nice if we could either uh, implement destroy in terms of destroy n or destroy n in terms of destroy, right? So we just have one implementation of the algorithm and the other is basically just like a more user-friendly version for like the data that you happen to have. Now this direction in general is, is not possible, right? Because how do we determine what n is? Well, like, okay, well, if we have random access iterators, then we just subtract them and it's fine, we get n. Um, but in general, that computing n could be very expensive. Um, and if we just have an input iterator, which is our minimum constraint on this algorithm, we'd need to walk the whole range to compute n, but then we can't walk the whole range again to destroy it, so like this isn't going to work. Um, so our only option is the other direction. And to do that, we turn to count an iterator. Um, count an iterator is one of the simpler and, and more useful iterator adapters in the standard library. And it is basically just an iterator and a length. And we're just going to go through and, and implement this. Not, not the whole thing, but just enough to be a, a, an iterator, uh, like an input or forward iterator. Um, dereferencing this iterator doesn't do anything special. It just dereferences the underlying iterator. Uh, so we're going to move that off to the side. Incrementing uh, is, is where we start to get interesting. right? So of course, we have to increment the underlying iterator. But now we kind of have the choice of, does our length count up from 0 to n, or does our length count down from n to 0? Um, and it turns out counting down from n to 0 is a much better choice because we can provide this equality against default sentinel, and we know we're done when length is 0. Right? Unconditionally. It doesn't matter where we started from. As soon as we hit 0, we're done. Um, so this makes it a more convenient thing. Uh, so default sentinel is this actually very simple type in the standard library. This is the entire specification. It's just this empty tag type. Um, and it's very useful for implementing uh, a, this the iterator sentinel comparison in the case that the iterator knows when it's done. Like, I don't need to write a special sentinel. I don't have any extra state that I need to keep track of. Right? So my counted iterator knows when it's done, when its length equals 0. Um, so if I'm writing a range around this, I don't, I don't need to do anything else. Um, so default sentinel is, is the tool for, for when this is good enough. You don't need um, anything else. And so with that, we're just going to add two more simple helpers, because those are pretty useful, which are just a getter for the underlying iterator and a getter for the underlying count. And that's it. This is, this is basically the whole counted iterator. And so using that, we can go back and we can try to implement. Uh, oh, so first, so here's, here's what our range looks like. And so if we visualize kind of what a counter iterator would do, if we construct it with, say, length of 3, we're basically just slapping a length onto this. Um, and so here's our new range, right? So here's our new half open range. And know that the element d still exists, right? It's there. Um, and, and we even like, will have access to it, uh, which becomes important uh, when, when we do this return. So. The first thing we do is we can call destroy using our new fancy new counted iterator with default sentinel. Um, and so now, now we're actually implementing one algorithm in terms of the other. We don't, we don't have this nice code duplication. Um, to make it super clear, last is a counted iterator of i. Uh, but what destroy n needs to do is return i, uh, not counted iterator of i. Uh, so that's last base. Um, so now this, this is the iterator to that d element. right? Um, so it, it does exist. And of course, we can simplify this to just calling destroy.base directly. Um, and this is how all of the end algorithms are basically implemented um, and, and specified for that matter. Now, you might think that we don't always need to do this. right? So like if our iterator is random access, it is very easy for us to compute the, the last iterator, just first plus n. Um, but in general, the, the counted iterator abstraction is so cheap and so lightweight uh, that this probably isn't even worth doing. Because if you think about the operations uh, that we're doing on the counted iterator, well, we're, we're decrementing an integer, and then we're comparing an integer to 0. Uh, even the cheapest random access iterator might be more expensive than that. Like, OK, best case, we have a pointer. So that's, that's a little bit more work, um, especially because like decrementing the pointer is like, we're now we're multiplying by size. Uh, but random access iterators can be more expensive than that. So they can be even, even more worth than that. So in general, like counted iterator is good enough, like really nice abstraction. So building on top of that, uh, in the same way the counted iterator adapts an iterator to take a length, 
take view adapts a range to take a length. Uh, so we can go through and basically do the same thing. Uh, begin is going to return our nice counter iterator that we already have. Um, and, and I'm just going to like keep using types to avoid CTAD and just make it very clear what's going on. Uh, so now end should end return default sentinel. So that was good enough for destroy n because in that case, we knew we were always taking exactly n elements. But here, this is a slightly different algorithm, right? This would be take exactly count. Um, and we don't know if we have count elements, right? We might run off the end first. So we need to provide a custom sentinel in this case. Um, so we're going to do that. And the sentinel is going to check two things, right? It, either the count reaches 0. So that's like the normal case. We've exhausted the count and iterator case. Or we've reached the underlying end normally. Those are two stopping conditions for the range. But we don't always need to do this, because sometimes we actually do know the size of the range. And so if the range is size, we can do something a little bit smarter and just construct the counter iterator with the correct size up front, which is going to be the smaller of the count we've taken on the size of the range. And then we can use default sentinel, because at that point, uh, we can reduce to take exactly, and we can just pick the correct size for the, for the take exactly. Um, but we don't really care about size ranges. I just wanted to throw that out there just for, for completeness. So building on top of that now, we have, we have iStream, which is a little bit more complicated. So now we need to keep track of storage, right? We're extracting elements. Those need to be stored somewhere. And, and those are going to go into the range object itself. We're going to have some iterator. I'm going to get back to that in a bit. Um, and like before, uh, our iterator is going to know when it's exhausted because it's exhausted when the stream's done. We don't really actually need any special sentinel, so default sentinel is good enough. So to fill in our iterator, uh, this is our API that we need to populate. One of the interesting things that C++20 did is that postfix increment is now allowed to return void. And this is particularly useful for input iterators because any operation on an input iterator uh, would invalidate any copy of it. And so if postfix increment returned a copy of the original iterator, that copy is immediately invalidated by the increment that you're doing. So, so that's not super useful, right? Like if we return a copy, the only thing you can do with that copy is immediately throw it away. Um, and so as a result, uh, you're allowed to return void, in which case the implementation is just you call prefix increment. Um, and th this is basically what you should do for, for all input iterators. OK, so the real question we have to ask is we have to extract elements right, uh, on demand. And, and where do we do this extraction? Right? Do we do it in prefix increment? Or, or do we do it in dereference? Now, hopefully, no one here thinks we should do it in the comparison to, to default Sentinel. Um, so I'm not even going like, to consider that as an option. Um, but uh, OK, so, so what's, what's our choice here? Um, so, so let's consider a dereference operator, right? Like, you know, maybe you know, I, I'm asking for an element, so maybe that's the point that, that I should go and find one. So let's say I had five ints in my range. Now, there's another useful adapter called stride. And so stride 2 is going to give you every other element. So in this case, it would just give me the 1, the 3, and the 5. And so you imagine the way that you might implement stride is just when you increment the stride iterator, that's going to increment the underlying iterator twice. What it's not going to do is dereference that iterator along the way. So if I try to do my extraction and dereference, this, this isn't going to work. right? Like stride isn't going to call my dereference. It's going to miss out um, on all these extra extractions, and I'm just going to get the wrong types, uh, the wrong elements. So that basically leaves extraction in the in prefix increment. And if we do that, of course, we also have to extract and begin because we're not going to call prefix increment to get the first element. We're going to call begin to get the first element. Uh, so we need to do this in both places. So let's go ahead and, and implement that. Right? So we're going to have this nice extract function, which is going to extract an element from the stream. The iterator needs to hold on to the parent because it, it needs all this state. It needs access to the stream, and it needs access to the storage. Uh, so dereference is just going to return a reference to the storage. Uh, our comparison to default sentinel, which is when is my iterator done, uh, is when the stream becomes falsy, uh, which could happen either at end of stream or if extraction fails. So if we have like a letter and we're extracting integers. And then both begin and prefix increment uh, will extract an element. Uh, begin extracts and then returns an iterator. Prefix increment extracts and then just returns this. All right, so now we have all the tools we need to actually understand what, what exactly is going on uh, when we compose these ranges in, in this specific way. So here's the code I had, and we're going to slowly desugar this all, all the way. So first, let's undo the range-based for loop. And so we get something like this. So here, first is a count iterator, and last is a take view sentinel. And so with these types, we, we know what this comparison means. 
And we know it even more if I change it to operator equals, which is the actual code that I showed on the slide. Right? And so counted view iterator compares to its sentinel. This is not the sized case. Uh, when one of two things is true, either the count becomes 0 or the underlying iterator hit the underlying end. All right, so now we can get over to last because we're not using it anymore. Let's go ahead and distribute the not. And I'm also going to rewrite the condition a bit as a while loop so that it actually fits on, on one line of code. So the next complicated thing is this, this long comparison over here with all the calls to base. So first at base is an iStream iterator. And the other uh, r.base at end is the iStream sentinel, which is default sentinel t. So what, what does that comparison mean? Well, an iStream iterator isn't end while input is true. Right? So, so we can throw that out. So at this point, uh, we can go on and we can do sugar take. The only thing take does at this point is give us a counted iterator, because I've already accounted for the sentinel comparison. And then we can split the counted iterator up into the count in the iterator um, and, and do that all the way through. Now, the last thing left is iStream. Uh, iStream at this point is basically just storage. Um, and so which we were extracting in both begin and the prefix increment. And dereference just gives us access to that storage. Right? And so now at this point, I've gone from this uh, fancy ranges code to, to fairly primitive operations. That's pretty easy to follow. Um, and note that like, I didn't do any like, optimizations along the way. This is pretty much rote rewriting of, of the code. And, and it translates very well, um, optimizes pretty nicely. So the question is, like, what does this block actually do, in particular when count equals 1? So what we're going to do is, first we're going to extract an element. Then we're going to decrement count. So count's going to become 0. Then we're going to check our condition. OK, so count has become 0. So we're going to finish our loop. Uh, and then we're going to close our block and destroy everything, at which point we don't have any access to storage anymore. right? We're done with, the, we're done with our loop. This was just like a local variable in here, and it's gone. Um, but right now, like, the storage was holding that last element that we extracted. right? There's, there's our 6. Um, so, so that's kind of where we went wrong. right? We extracted this element on the last iteration of this loop, uh, but then we don't have any access to it. So first, let's talk about, like, OK, well, how do I recover access to it? So th the first thing I have to do is, like, well, I can't just construct this thing in the loop because I know I need it to survive. Um, so I need to hold on to it. Um, but the thing is in the iterator. So I actually have to go back to, the, to iterator land at this point. Um, and at that point, well, now I can get back from my counted iterator to my iStream iterator. Uh, but of course, I have to move because it's not actually copyable. And, and then I can compare that to end uh, of, of the stream because I don't know yet if my stream was exhausted. And at this point, if I do all of this, I, I do get the 6. right? So I, I have to be very careful about my, my use of iterators here. Now, range v3 makes this a little bit better in that iStream view actually has a function on it called cached, uh, which, which I can access in this way. Um, so it's nicer in the sense that I don't have to drop all the way down to iterate to access it. Uh, but you also just have to know exactly how, how this works to even know that this is like a reasonable thing to do. Um, because cache just returns a reference. It doesn't return an optional reference. Um, so you need to know that you have to check the stream in advance. So it's, it's not even necessarily obvious to me if like, just, just stood iStream, do you need this thing or not? So the question a lot of you might be asking at this point is, is of course, like, is this broken uh, and can it be fixed? And, and I really want to stress, like, is this broken is, is a question at this point. Like, I, don't, I don't think it's a statement. Um, I, think, I think it's very easy to look at an example and really overfit on, like, OK, well, this is weird. This, this weird example is something that we immediately need to go and change a lot of behavior to address. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know that that's necessarily obvious. Um, so, so let's kind of go through and see you know, where, where did we go wrong in this example, and, and, wh and what can we learn from this? So as I showed, like, Here's what we had for counted iterator. And I, I kind of demonstrated that you know, th this is the box that went wrong when length equals 1. Because right? we have this last underlying iterator increment that happens. Now, now, that last underlying increment isn't always bad. If our range is random access, for instance, that increment is always cheap. It's, it's a constant time operation. Doing it or not doing it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So let's kind of just exclude the random access iterator case. Now, in our particular case, the iterator is input. So incrementing an input iterator is, is consuming information. Right? So, so in that case, that extra increment is something that we really want to avoid because that, that could be destroying info that we have no other way of acquiring. But even in the non-input case, let's say we had even a bidirectional iterator, that iterator could be a filter. So that last iterator increment could be a linear time operation that we don't want to do for performance reasons. So there, there's multiple reasons to want to avoid that extra increment. So let, let's kind of try to do that. You know, let, let's flip this around and decrement the length first, and only conditionally increment the iterator. Right? So if it is random access, it's totally fine to keep doing it, so we don't want to pay the cost 
of, of checking to see if we need to. But in the other cases, OK, like we, we think we really need to avoid this extra increment. So let, let's go ahead and try to do that. So the first thing wrong with this is, of course, like, OK, so now we've taken this very cheap abstraction and introduced a branch on every increment. You know, not amazing, uh, to say the least. But we also have this other problem, which is where else do we use current in this implementation? In base, right? And so if base is just returning current, this implementation is, is wrong at this point, right? So if I'm constructing my counted iterator using this visualization I showed earlier, base is first going to give me the A, and then the B, and then the C, and then the C again, uh, which, is, which is not what we wanted, right? Because we do want access to that D. Um, and we already saw some code where we actually wanted to get D out. OK, so let's try to fix this. Um, and let's kind of ignore like, all the other code that we don't need anymore. So this seems simple, right? OK, so if length was 0, we, need to, we know that we need to increment the iterator. Otherwise, we're fine, right? Um, but OK, well, not exactly this, right? Because if it's random access, then we were, we were already correct. Uh, so we don't need to remember to check that. So OK, so this is good, right? So now, now in the end case, we are actually returning uh, D. Uh, so that's good. You know, ship it. OK, so let's say I'm constructing a counted iterator over some iterator with, with some length. Uh, and I'm calling base right away. All right? What, what is J? It, it's I, right? Like, I haven't done anything. I haven't advanced my iterator. Uh, it, it, like, it, it had better not have changed. Um, so J and I really had better be the same iterator. And that had really had better be true for, for n equals 0 as well. Now, I don't expect people to be writing a lot of counted iterator of i comma 0 in their code, maybe standard library implementers. I don't know if Marshall's here. Uh, but this is definitely an edge case that comes up in code. Um, so in particular, in this destroy n example, you can imagine that I'm implementing a, a container, and I might call destroy n with begin and size. And so when I do this, I had better get begin back when size is 0. Uh, so you know, what we have here isn't quite right. So we need to do a little bit more work. We, we, need, we need some more stakes. We need to keep track of whether we actually need to advance again, uh, which starts off as false, which, which should handle our uh, initial construction zero case. And that's going to become true if we avoided incrementing current. And then we can use that instead of our length of zero check to properly adjust base. And of course, we don't always need the state, right? So again, if we're random access, this is like a conditional member that, we, that we, is, is totally unnecessary, right? So like we want to show it in kebab case so that it doesn't actually take any extra storage. OK, so this is, this is better. We're, we're slowly getting closer. Um, of course, I, you know, I haven't talked about decrement because counted iterator can be bidirectional. So like this is, this is a whole mess of getting uh, decrement correctly to keep track of the state properly. I'm not actually going to do it. But, but even base alone is already kind of a problem. So first, just kind of fundamentally, we've taken an operation that is always cheap because we're just returning uh, the current member to something that is sometimes expensive for some iterator types uh, sometimes, that, which is not like a great semantic uh, to begin with. Um, but even setting aside from there, this actually isn't what the signature of base looks like for any of the iterators. Uh, we actually always provide two. So one of the other things that we changed in the iterator model in C++20 is that iterators are allowed to be move only which is a very useful property for input iterators, again, because you can't actually have two independent copies anyway. And so it's helpful to just make the iterator not copyable um, to, to catch all those issues. And so uh, we have a R value qualified base that just returns an iterator by value, and an L value reference qualified base that returns a reference to the underlying iterator. And of course, the R value one needs to move uh, all the iterators. Now, this one is kind of OK. We're returning things by value. This works. Uh, of course, it's still sometimes expensive, but it's a function you're only going to call once anyway, so it's not, maybe not uh, a big deal. Um, but the other one is, is kind of a problem, right? We're returning a reference uh, to const i. This is not something that we want to bind a reference to, right? Like ranges next current is going to give me a temporary that's immediately going to dangle. Uh, so that's not great. But we might think, OK, we can kind of recover this. We're, we got concepts. This is not bad. So in the random access case, OK, fine, maybe we can return a reference to const. And that works fine. Um, and in the other case, we'll just return it. Uh, we'll return a copy. Um, so now this runs into another issue where it's like, OK, but not all iterators are copyable. This is the whole point that we're doing this to begin with. So this is now requires forward iterator, because that's the weakest category that requires copyable. Um, and maybe, maybe we can strain this on copyable instead of forward iterator. It doesn't actually super matter. Um, but the point is, like. L value base requires more stuff. Um, and if we go back to take view, well, what does take view sentinel comparison do? Well, it calls L value base, which now has this extra constraint on it, 
which means we can't call it on the iStreamView iterator. So our attempt at fixing this problem actually just, like, doesn't even compile anymore while trying to like, finagle this to work. Now maybe like, we can think, like, OK, well, base, we don't actually need base in this case. right? Like, all this extra fix up that we were doing to get base to be correct for the count equals 0 case, we don't even need that. Like, it counts never going to be 0 when we call this. Um, so like, maybe we need some other API that's like, base-ish for this case. Uh, I don't know. But like, what I do know at this point is that our counter iterator has gone from this very simple abstraction that, that's very efficient to this very complicated state machine uh, very rapidly. And it doesn't even work yet, right? So we're not even done. So it's, it's not even clear like, what we're going to do here. And fundamentally, the issue is we have to go back to this half open range case. So this element d exists. And, and we sometimes have access to it. And we sometimes want access to it. But in this particular case, we definitely don't. Uh, and we want to avoid getting access to it. So what we really wanted was a closed range. We wanted our three elements. And these are the only three elements we want to exist. And we're kind of stuck with this impedance mismatch on the model by trying to prevent us from getting this extra past the end element that we really don't want to exist here. Um, so I'll get back to this in, in a bit. But first, let, let's go to a different algorithm, copy n, uh, another algorithm that we've had for a long time. So uh, copy n takes a input iterator and a size, and it's going to copy n elements out of that input range into the output range. And you'll note that it only returns the output iterator. right? So this immediately is violating that law of useful return because copy n is, is doing work. right? It's, it's advancing this input iterator n times. Um, and that might be useful information to the caller. Of course, it's definitely useful to have the output iterator because the next thing you might want to do is to copy more stuff into that new location of the output iterator. Um, so one of the things that C++20 does in its version of copy n, in addition to having you know, fancy concepts, is that the return type is, is a pair. Well, it's not literally a pair. It actually has named members in and out. Um, but you can think of it as semantically a pair of the new input iterator and the new output iterator. And so the question is, like, which input iterator does it return? Like, what, which value is it? Um, and so, so not a trick question. Of course, it's returning first plus n. Um, or, or is it a trick question? I don't know. So, Let's look at this code right here. Uh, it's very similar to the original example, except instead of using ranges, I'm just using iterators. You might notice this very ominous, shouty, caps, italics namespace, uh, which, which may play a role shortly. So, so what we're doing is we're, we're copying from this input, uh, from this iStream iterator into our vector. We're printing the vector. And then again, we're extracting another element conditionally and, and printing it. And so if we use std ranges, we get, we get the same output that, that we had from the original example. Uh, of course, I'm printing a vector instead, but you know, we're getting 1 through 5, and then next has the value of 7, uh, as you might expect. Now here, it's a little bit easier to recover the next element because, well, we could just not ignore the return of copy n. It, it just gives it to us. right? Copy n is going to return our new input iterator, which uh, we can use in structured bindings, um, and then dereference it, and, and there's our 6 right there. Indeed, since we don't need O, I can access the in member directly uh, from the result. Um, and this is, this is pretty nice. We get it right here. So naturally, if I use std copy n instead of ranges copy n, I get the same result, um, except I don't. You notice that this version prints 6. So why, why does it do something different? Like it's, it's the same algorithm, right? I'm copying n elements from my, from my input into my output. Uh, why, why am I getting different results? I thought the whole point of ranges was to just provide a nicer interface onto this. And the answer is because we don't actually specify what this algorithm does. Um, <laughs> so we have this library issue that the number of input iterator increments is unspecified. And if you read through this, uh, all the implementations deliberately avoid that last increment problem uh, for this reason. Right? They deliberately avoid that last increment um, to, to avoid that last extraction. Um, and so because like, the algorithm doesn't actually return the new input iterator, this kind of isn't like, super observable, um, except when you like, access the stream directly. And so there was the suggested resolution of, of exactly kind of what, what we've been going through. Is, is, um, here it was just in the non-forward case, um, avoid that last increment. But it turns out like, here uh, it doesn't work for a, or a different reason. Um, I especially appreciate the this is a mess uh, at, the, at the beginning of the effects. So we actually have two different iStream iterator types in the standard library. One's called iStream iterator. One's called iStream buff iterator. iStream iterator is templated on any type. iStream buff iterator has to be a char. And you notice that if you look at their constructors, they're very similar, except one of them has this extra increment. Uh, and, and so th they have different behavior. So well, let's look at a, a different range. This is obviously my phone number. And so if we have an iStream buff iterator of char, 
and we dereference it right away, what we'll get is the eight. Um, the first, of course, we'll get the eight. Um, but even after we construct it, the first element of the stream is still going to be eight if we observe the stream separately from the input iterator. When we advance the iStream buff iterator, we're going to consume that eight that's gone, and the top element of the stream is going to become six. So because iStream buff iterator is just directly returning into, buffer, into that buffer, it's only ever a character type, um, that buffer is already there. Right? So we don't have to do work to find what the first character in the buffer is. It's just the top character. iStream iterator is a little bit different. And this is pretty obvious to see if you think of iStream iterator of int. So how is iStream iterator of int going to return that first int to you? Like, it, it needs to consume some arbitrary number of characters to get that int. In this case, it has to consume four characters to, to give you that 867. And so it has to consume things from the stream even to produce that first value. Now, you might think that, OK, well, what about char? Like, I don't, I don't need to consume an arbitrary number of chars to give you a char. Uh, maybe, maybe for char, I should like, keep that first character into the stream. Um, but that's not a great choice, because like, it would be nice if all of our specializations of a template had the same semantics, uh, you know, vector bool. But, but even outside of that, um, iStream iterator does this extra thing where it also skips leading white space. So if our, if our stream started with a space, the first character that iStream buff iterator would give you would be that space. Um, but iStream iterator char would, would still give you that 8. What's, what this means is that if we're iterating with these two different iterator types across the stream, and then we're observing the stream separately, what we'll see is that when both of these iterators dereference to that 8, the front of the stream is in different places. right? Because iStream iterator has already consumed that element. iStream buff iterator has not yet. So as we go, we, we're just like off by one forever. Um, and, and the consequence of this is that there's no right answer for both iterator types, right? Um, and so whatever we do for one is, is going to break the other. Um, and this is kind of like a fu fundamental kind of issue. Um, and so, so I would argue that like, maybe this isn't necessarily broken, right? Like we, we tried to go through and fix counted iterator um, in a way that would work for iStream iterator, but not iStream buff iterator. Um, and we ended up actually breaking counting iterator and even breaking the iStream iterator use case to begin with. Um, but you know, let's kind of set that aside. And can we at least provide a tool that that does the right thing. Um, and there we can, right? So we can take our counted iterator and let's just rename it to closed counted iterator so we can produce a, the closed range that we want. Um, we're going to do that same thing for increment where we only conditionally increment in the last case to, to prevent the last increment. Um, but now instead of base, we're going to call it unsafe base. We're going to add a precondition to it. And we're going to say, you can only call base if there are actually elements left. Because I'm going to very strongly pretend that that last element does not exist. You're not allowed to observe it. Because um, this, this is our problem, right? Like, we've counted it already. We couldn't get base to work, so we couldn't get a consistent API. Um, but if we just like, provide a different API that doesn't have that consistency problem, then we, we, just don't, we just don't have that problem. So if we compare these two implementations and see what they do, well, OK, they're going to do different amounts of increments. Of course, that was, that was the goal. Um, and so base is going to be valid or invalid at the end. And there isn't really a right answer to this question, right? Sometimes we really wanted base at the end to give us that iterator. And sometimes we really wanted that to not happen. We do not want access to that element at all. And there's just no solution that does both of those things, because those are very contrasting requirements. Um, OK, so we can build on top of uh, take view in the same way. We can provide a closed take view that similarly returns a closed counted iterator and calls unsafe base instead, just like this rote mechanical change. And we have to comment on, like, OK, well, how safe is this usage of, of unsafe base? Uh, so we, we had two problems with this originally. So one was that we tried to return a value of an iterator that might not be copyable. So we don't have that problem anymore because this unconditionally returns a reference. Uh, but now unsafe base has this precondition that length is greater than 0, which thankfully we don't have to worry about because we just checked that case right there. So if the count was already 0, uh, we're, we're done. We know that we're done. And so we're only going to call unsafe base uh, when, when the count is positive. Um, so this, this totally works out. And so if I change the original example from take to close take, suddenly, suddenly I'm printing the 6 again. And that, this is probably the desired behavior of the original problem. And this doesn't require me to lower back down to iterators or to add more members to, to iStream view to, to pull out that cache element. And so this is actually kind of what we talked about in Library Evolution for the whole week in Issaquah, uh, more or less of like, should we provide this close take thing? There are a number of different names that we threw out for what close take should be, like lazy take or, or finite um, or something. Um, but the, the solution is fairly unsatisfactory uh, for a number of reasons that I'm sure you're all thinking about. Um, so let's kind of go back to this slide. So 
I asked if, if this was broken, and I kind of immediately zoomed in on counted iterator, right? And, and that's, a, that's an easy thing to do, because counted iterator in its increment was where our extra increment happened. Um, and so, so maybe there's actually a different it that we can think about um, for, for how to fix this problem. So let's go back to our, our totally uh, desugared version, and let's add that extra uh, if that we added in our closed take version, right? So, so this is uh, where, where begin uh, happens. This is our comparison to our Sentinel, and this is our uh, increment from our counted iterator, right? So if I remove the boxes, maybe it'll be a little bit easier to see. Now, this code does not look amazing. There, there's a few uh, things that might strike you about it. You know, the first thing that might strike you is that I have two comparisons of counts, like back to back. That, that just seems inherently less than ideal. Um, it would be nice if there was only one branch on count that we were doing per iteration. But there's another interesting problem with this code in that begin is unconditionally extracting an element before I am even checking count, right? So one of our first edge cases was like uh, making sure that counted iterator of zero dot base actually worked. And here, uh, even views close take of zero would extract an element. Um, so the original claim that it does, you know, n minus one extractions isn't quite right because it always does at least one. Um, so what we really want to do if we look at the completely uh, desugar code is this is the loop structure that we actually want, right? We want every extraction to be guarded by check against count. And we want even the first extraction to be guarded by this count. Um, and so this is, this is a pretty nice structure, right? Like I only have one check of count per element. Um, and it, it does the right thing. It's efficient. Uh, and it doesn't even extract the first element. So the question might be like, okay, well, how do we turn this into, into our iterator model, right? And so if you think about it, like I have a while loop, I have a condition, there's only one place in the iterator model that allows a condition, which is, which is the it is not equal to end comparison. So, so let's see kind of what we can do. Let's go back to our iStream view example, and let's kind of just totally wipe away the implementation because maybe it's wrong. Um, and, I, and I had asked this question before, of, of where do we extract the next value? And, and I focused on, on these two uh, operators. And, and Jonathan gave me this funny look. Um, and, and he was kind of right to. So the original argument that I made uh, was that we can't extract in the dereference operator. And we can't extract in the dereference operator because we, we need stride to work. Uh, but there's another thing that we also need to work, which is that if I call begin on this view and I immediately dereference that iterator, that does need to give me the first element, right? Like if I know that there's stuff in the stream, I don't need to check against n first, right? I can just call dot begin and dereference, and as long as there actually is something there, that's a valid operation. Uh, but we don't want to extract an element in begin. So in order for begin and then dereference to give me the right elements, I need to extract in dereference. Um, but then going back to the strat example, in order for the strat example to work, I need a dereference and increment as well, because that's the only operation that's actually going to be called there. Uh, but then in the, in the slide I just showed, uh, the first operation that's going to happen is going to be the comparison. So I, so I kind of need to extract in the comparison as well, because that's really my only option of getting an element there. So really the answer to this question of where do we extract is yes. <laughs> uh, we extract everywhere. Uh, so first we're going to start by begin is just going to return an iterator. It's not going to do any work at all, because we want to avoid that first extraction before we even check anything. And, and in order for this to work, we need to add some more states. We're going to add a dirty flag. And this function called prime, which if we're dirty, like if we still need to get another element, we're going to extract one and set the dirty flag to false. And so the reason for this is if we call prime and we call prime again, we're not going to extract another element. Uh, and until we reset the dirty flag to true, when we really do know that we need a new one. So dereference now is going to prime the parent and then return the value. So this might extract an element or not. Note that if you call dereference multiple times in a row, you're always going to get the same element. It might extract one the first time, but it's not going to extract one the second time, or the third time, or the fourth time. You're always going to get the same element. Uh, same for equality. Again, you might extract an element on, the, on your first equality, but you're not going to extract an element ever again. So if you call it multiple times, you're always going to get the same answer multiple times, right? It's, you're, it's not, you're not going to get this weird behavior where you're going to extract multiple elements, and then like suddenly like you're, you keep calling these const member functions, but you start getting different answers. So this is totally fine. Uh, in our increment operator, of course, we, we need a prime because we need to conditionally extract an element again. And now we need to set the dirty flag to true because the whole point of increment is to advance to the next element. And if we don't do this, uh, it's all fine that we're all conditionally extracting, but we're only going to get the same element uh, over, over and over again. We do need to make progress at some point. So at this point, if we, if we do it this way, this actually optimizes very poorly. 
Um, and if any of you went to John McCall's talk on Monday, he kind of went over why, is that you know, our iterator just has a pointer to this parent, and compilers can't necessarily tell that like, the iterator is the only thing that's accessing this, this dirty bit. And it might have changed out from under you at any time, um, especially because we're doing like iStream operations, and those are virtual functions, and who knows what they do. Um, so in general, like, compilers will just keep reloading the dirty flag every time. Um, and that sucks. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to move all of that state into the iterator. So now, unfortunately, we have to make dirty mutable, because um, prime has to be a const member function. But otherwise, this is the same implementation. We're just moving where we're marking the state. Um, and this way, the dirty flag is local to the iterator, and, and compilers can reason about this better. Right. So all of our operations now call prime first, and then do whatever I showed you uh, that they did beforehand. So if we go back to this implementation and explode out uh, what, what I just showed, um, it, it turns into this. Now, trying to fit the whole comparison into a while loop doesn't really work, so I, I'm, I'm rewriting it into an infinite loop. Um, I'm sure Andre would be proud of me. Um, but, but otherwise, this is logically the, the same thing. I just, this, this makes it possible to write. So here is now our full comparison to end from, from our counter iterator to its sentinel. Here is our increment. Um, and and this, uh, sorry, there, there is our dereference operation. And here is our increment. And so, so there's a lot of code uh, going on here. Right? This, is, this is a lot more code than we had before. Um, but, but there's something interesting about it. Right? Um, if you track dirty throughout the course of this loop, so the first time, uh, through the loop, dirty is true. And the last thing we do unconditionally is set dirty to true. And this is very easy for the compiler to track, especially because now dirty is just a member of the iterator. So the first branch is unconditionally taken, because dirty, we know dirty is true. That's going to set dirty to false. And that means that the next two branches are just never taken. This is, this is very straightforward uh, for the compiler to optimize. And so we can just go ahead and remove all of this code. And if I condense it down, this is now the structure actually that we're going for. Uh, we only have uh, one check against count uh, that, that happens up top. That check against count is guarding our storage extraction. So if count were 0 to start with, we're never extracting any elements. Um, but it's also guarding that last element. Um, so if we're, once count hits 0, we're, we're not going to extract that sixth element, because um, we, don't, we don't have to. Um, and we only have one check that needs to do this. And as a result, if I use iStream2, because uh, of course we need a name, uh, now I'm going to get the 6 again. And I can get the 6 even with the same take. I don't need a special kind of take that has like a slightly different interface and slightly different preconditions. Um, and this, this actually works. Um, this is kind of an interesting, different approach. Yeah, David. With that mutable, you're, you're breaking const thread safety for that class. Yes. So. Um, so there's, I'm glad you asked that. So there, there's a lot of uh, semantic requirements in all of these operations. Um, so one of them is equality preservation, which I talked about. It's like you want to get the same answer every time you call it, which we do. Um, the other is we have this rule in res on data races that says that const member functions of standard library types are not allowed to introduce data races. And uh, that's a pretty hard and fast rule that we uh, adhere to throughout the standard library. Um, but it has a lot of interesting implications, especially for input iterators. Um, and it limits a lot of interesting things that we might want to do. So, uh, so one interesting adapter that we kind of want to pursue for C26 is called cache. Uh, it just it does what it says on the tin. It just caches the last value. Because while, while we think about the dereference operation on iterator as being very cheap, because we liken iterators to pointers, that dereference operation could actually do like an arbitrary amount of work, right? Like that dereference could be uh, come from a transform iterator which calls a function that could do a lot of work. Um, and one of the things that people run into uh, a lot when when they start working with ranges is that if you have a transform followed by a filter, that's going to call your transform function twice for every element uh, that meets that predicate. And so um, if you go go watch my last uh, CPP now talk actually from two years ago, like I kind of go into why, and the only way to kind of recover that is you want to cache the results uh, of that transform so you don't call this function multiple times. But the only way to cache the result of that function is the same way I've kind of showed here of doing that, is you need to do that in dereference. That's the only opportunity you have for doing so. Um, and this, this, again, runs into the same problem of like, OK, well, dereference is const. So how can we achieve doing that? Um, well, one is like, oh, we, we can weaken the restrictions, and we can say that. Uh, Input iterators are allowed to have mutable 
uh, operator dereference. Um, this is terrible. Uh, so it's, it's not terrible because, OK, well, it's, it, it actually is mutating, so it kind of makes sense for it to be mutable. But if you think about how difficult it is to implement a range adapter today with all your cons and non-cons members of every kind, having cons and non-cons you reference would be, would be kind of awful. Um, and it's just like, it just seems like a nightmare uh, to, to even think about. And, and that doesn't actually even help you for the equality case, because in this case, we also uh, need to do some mutation on equality for the same reason. And that seems even more unlikely to support mutable, mutable operator equals. Um, so the next solution might be, it's like, OK, well, we're not allowed to do, introduce data races, so maybe we should add synchronization. Right? So uh, let's just like slap some kind of synchronization primitive uh, on each thing and kind of like specify that this has to happen. Now, in, in these examples, like that synchronization is, is actually can be pretty cheap because um, we only have to guard against like a certain amount of things, um, and probably an atomic int is, is sufficient. We need, don't need like a full mutex or anything. Um, that that seems kind of unsatisfactory in a lot of ways. Um, for iStream, maybe it's fine because like we're doing an extraction from an iStream anyway, so the cost of the extra synchronization probably doesn't doesn't matter. But realistically, these are input iterators. What are you doing? that you have multiple threads trying to access the same input iterator when you can only have one of these things at a time. That's like a fundamentally weird structure and you probably went wrong somewhere. So it's, it's kind of interesting to think about of like maybe it's worth relaxing that restriction on input iterators specifically simply because that is not a useful guarantee in this case. Now it's not a conversation that we've had. Uh, I, I have paragraphs in a paper that is not published uh, written about this. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mm -hmm. Sankel. I think that if you go with Atomic, on most architectures, or at least on Intel architectures, you're not going to see a penalty uh, with a single threaded application. So all, all that it'll do is it'll make it so that if you happen to put this in a class that maybe has it as part of a variant or something like that, it won't break that class's const thread safety that it would get by default. Um, if, if all the other things for conference say that, that were part of the hierarchy or whatever. The problem is that, that simply atomic store isn't enough because it's like if dirty uh, read from input and change dirty, you would have to run a cast loop on it to, to, to avoid two threads getting the same. <coughs> or you would have to run like a spin log basically exchange. You would, you would loop on, you probably wouldn't run a cast loop, you would loop on exchange. Hmm. Because you know, just checking the two are, that are there, it's dirty. All the rest come in, see that it's not dirty, and all of them happily enter the critical section. So it's certainly worth benchmarking. I don't have numbers uh, for you right now. Uh, I saw another hand. I think at some point. No. Okay. So. So this is, uh, I think, an interesting direction. Of course, it, this is a pretty invasive change to, to iStream, because uh, iStream is specified to do the, the first implementation I showed. Um, and uh, allowing this second implementation is, is a pretty involved surgery one way or another. I mean, if we, if we require synchronization, it's, it's pretty localized to this. Um, but there's a lot of other interesting input, uh, input ranges that we're thinking of pursuing for 26 that, that also run into the same kind of problem. They, they need to do work in one or both of the other const member functions. Um, and so it, it's something that like, needs to be addressed. Um, and, I, and I think it's probably worth addressing this on that side more than the take side. Because having a close take is useful. And, and there are definitely cases where you might want to use it in, in new circumstances. But it would be better if, like, right, if it just worked. Right? If iStream view take actually just did the thing that you probably wanted it to do uh, to begin with. So additional reading on this topic. So where I first ran into this example is P2406, um, which was originally titled Fix Counted Iterator Interaction with Input Iterators, and over the course of its lifetime has changed title to Adelaide's Counted Iterator, because it turns out that, that fixing counted iterator really is, is a non-solution to this problem. Um, it, it like to, any, any attempt to fix counted iterator to handle this example uh, basically breaks all the uses of counted iterator for every other example. Um, so it's it's, it's not, a, not a great direction. Um, so uh, kind of response to that paper uh, was Tim Song's P2799, uh, which talked about how uh, closed ranges are something that the iterator model just doesn't handle very well. Um, you need this extra state, and these are, these are special things. And so kind of trying to uh, get counted iterator to address 
both the half open and closed range uses is just doesn't doesn't work. There's no there's no there there um, that we can really get to. All right, so bonus example, because um, we, we actually have plenty of time, is uh, so what does this program do? Uh, so we have views io to zero iota, fantastic name. Um, so if you're not familiar, iota zero is an infinite range of ints starting at zero. Uh, we're going to filter on all of the ints that are less than five, and then we're going to take five. So what does this program do? Well, since you're asking us, they both go hand. Uh, indeed, and, and, and a hint might be that, that these two programs don't do the same thing. Um, and so, uh, they don't print the same thing? Or? So they, they do print the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so the first one is an infinite loop. Um, and this is because uh, of the ultimately the same underlying issue. So take, once we get to five, we have to increment the underlying iterator. The underlying iterator in this case is a filter iterator. And so what does filters uh, iterator increment do? Well, it has to find the next element that satisfies the predicate or the end of the underlying range. Now, there is no end of the underlying range because my underlying range is infinite. Uh, and there's also no further element that satisfies the predicate uh, because I've already printed all the numbers that are less than five. So it, it just keeps going for forever. Um, probably on a real architecture eventually into a loop around um, and it'll exit possibly printing zero at the end if you wait long enough. Isn't that undefined behavior? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's totally undefined. Um, so, so whereas close take kind of prevents that last increment from happening so this, this happily terminates. Um, so here you might notice that there's no iStream view for us to mess with to kind of uh, make take work. Um, so th this example is also in P2406 and there are other iterator models in which, in which the above example just works. Like if you have, um, so the Rust model that's just producing elements on demand, this does actually terminate and work. Um, there really is like no good solution to, to this problem. Um, but also like I don't actually find this problem as interesting as, as the other one. And this is because like if you try to do take six, even if you did close take six, that's going to be an infinite loop anyway. And there's, there's nothing at all we can do there anyway. So the fact that like this one edge condition we can, we can make work, I don't know, maybe isn't the most interesting example. I mean, it's definitely an interesting example to stick on a slide and, and be like, what does this do? Uh, but I don't know that it's the most compelling example to, to start trying to, to mess with and fix. And yeah, so you know, I, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, thank, you. thank you for coming to my talk. Um, any of you have uh, any, any questions? Yeah, Jeff. So what is the plan? <laughs> <laughs> is the plan? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so there is no plan right now. Um, so P2406, that paper is currently pursuing um, the w what I presented here as, as the closed uh, take and closed counter iterator. Um, it calls it lazy take and lazy counter iterator. There is no good name for this. Um, Tim wants to call it finite. Uh, so, um, so that's currently in progress. And, and that's a fairly easy thing to define. Like it, it basically does what I, what I presented here. Um, is that a good idea? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, separately, uh, for other things I'm hoping to pursue for 26 is a lot of the kind of input ranges that I talked about. Um, and that really involves asking this question of like, well, what do we want to do uh, about these const member functions that we kind of want to do work in? Um, this is something that we wanted to do originally in the C++ 23 timeframe, because we thought cache was a very important adapter to pursue. Um, we ended up punting because we didn't want to deal with that problem. And one of our main motivations for that is having join work for PR value ranges. Um, this is like a very common thing that people want to do is like, I have a range of ints, I want to transform it with a function that returns a, like a vector of int, and then I want to like flatten that out, right? So this is flat map uh, in a bunch of other languages, except we call our flatten join and we call our transform map, uh, or we call our map transform, so we would call it transform join, I guess. I don't know. Um, but that's a common operation to do, and originally join didn't support that use case at all. You couldn't join ranges of PR value ranges. And our initial solution to that was, was cache, right? So we, we take our range of PR value ranges and we make it look like a range of L value ranges by, by stashing this thing somewhere. Um, and the solution there was instead of stashing this range in this new adapter, why don't we just stash this range in join itself? And, and that works, and that's what we have right now in the, in the standard. That's one of, the, one of our defects uh, against C++20. And so that kind of let us punt on this cache problem uh, until now. But there, there's a lot of places where, where this kind of thing comes up. Um, there's, there's other interesting adapters as well, like generate, generate n, 
both might need to do this kind of mutation. Um, iterate is another interesting like generator factory kind of thing and, and recurse as well. So like we, we do need to answer this question at some point. And so like is, is that question going to be relax res on data races or, or mandate uh, synchronization? Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I mean, it sounds like synchronization is going to be potentially quite expensive. Uh, it, it definitely needs to be benchmarked. Um, and it probably also needs to be met benchmarked on, on GPU as well, um, in, in addition to CPU, because those answers are probably different. And I don't know anything about GPU except that it exists. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that, that someone uh, will, will give me help at some point. Uh, yeah, in the back. So the um, filter example is really interesting. And I'm not really quite up on the exact um, definitions of how this is, this is working. But it seems like part of the problem here is that we've lost the random access character of the IOTA um, iterator, right? Mm -hmm. This would have worked if we had preserved that random access character. And I assume this means filter is not really required to preserve that character. Right, so filter in general can't be random access because oh, right. you don't know that it's going to give you consecutive. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's other filtering algorithms that do preserve random access. Um, so like take uh, drop while and take until or take while because um, we're already, we're only dropping a chunk from the beginning or end. So, so the chunk that's left is, is random access if the original was, but like filter could like drop every other element. And so we're kind of, we're kind of doomed there. Yeah, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you, meant, you mentioned that the, with the Rust iterator model, uh, this, this case would just work, uh, but then uh, uh, followed that up by saying that there's no, uh, uh, there's no really good solution here. Do you mean no really good solution given the C++ iterator yeah. model? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, you, you can always, I mean, this is C++, so we can, we can always just like have a different iteration library, um, and, and those exist uh, that, that like implement the Rust library, for instance. Um, the, uh, and these models have like very different trade-offs, right? So um, it's just that this example happens to work quite well in, in that model, but not in ours. Yep. You started off by by talking about the analogy between the um, algorithm and the algorithm underscore n. Mm -hmm. um, so is this analogy uh, eventually a, a prevalent part of this issue, or did we? Or, and, how, and if so, uh, why why do we need to keep it? So, uh, so this is something that we've had since like the inception of the standard template library is like we have all these pairs of, of algorithms because sometimes you have the size and sometimes you have an end iterator and it just like depends, right? So like the fact that we can very conveniently implement one in terms of the other is, is pretty nice. Um, and that, that is one, one case, but, but hardly the only, where you really do want that new end iterator. So like omitting that last increment is not okay for, for those algorithms. Um, you really do need that new end one because that's what that's what callers are going to expect. Um, in the same way that like copy n and stood ranges, like it really does return first plus n. Um, the fact that the fact that in in copy n it doesn't is like mostly unobservable, so it kind of gets away with the fact that we don't specify it. Um, but but yeah, that's that's just like one of the motivations for why um, it it works the way it does. And the fact that the iterator model is half open is kind of why counter iterator is so easy to implement that way, right? Like we don't have to worry about this thing, it just kind of falls out. Um, it's, it's only once we started messing with like the, those crossing that model boundary between half open and closed that, that it does, just doesn't work very well. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.